Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us for today's uh, ADR Services Inc. in-house MC daily program entitled Partition Actions 101, an introduction to statutes, remedies, and resolution of partition actions. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who is joining us today. And thank you very much to our speakers for putting together today's program. Um, great. So now I'd love to move on and introduce some of our speakers and let them get underway with this fabulous program. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Judge Elizabeth Pfeffer uh, with ADR Services, Inc. Uh, Judge Pfeffer um, had over 13 years of judicial service in Los Angeles, uh, where she presided over more than 75 civil jury trials, more than 500 civil bench trials, hundreds of evidentiary hearings, and numerous settlement conferences. In addition to her court, uh, her civil court assignments, Judge Pfeffer served for four years in the Family Law Division, where she presided over and issued rulings on thousands of cases involving all types of complex family law matters. She's lauded for her eloquence and exceptional legal knowledge. Judge Pfeffer is known for her thorough preparation and ability to connect with litigants. Her patience, compassion, and dedication have helped establish her reputation as an even-handed and esteemed jurist. Um, she specializes in a number of areas, which include employment litigation, professional liability, personal injury, elder abuse, products liability, business litigation, partnership disputes, um, and especially relevant to today's presentation will be the real estate litigation. Um, and she's available uh, for mediation, arbitration, discovery references, partition actions, you name it. Judge Pfeffer is your gal. I would love to hand it over to Judge Pfeffer to introduce our other speakers and get our program on the way. Great. Thank you, Katie. And again, more than just a few of those bench trials were partition cases. So I'm super excited to be presenting Partition Actions 101 with uh, two extraordinary attorneys. First, the formal introduction to them and the informal introduction. So the formal introduction first to Curtis Holdsworth. Curtis began his legal career at the preeminent full service law firm of Greenberg Glusker. There he handled a variety of complex business, real estate and employment disputes. During the span of his 25 year professional career, Curtis has served as lead co-counsel on partition cases, which is why he's here, involving both residential property and commercial realty, including the successful partition sale of a private golf course. He's managed many high-profile cases for publicly traded clients in federal courts and the complex panel of state courts, including the litigation of complex choice of law and jurisdictional issues. And finally, Curtis has prosecuted and defended cases involving unfair business practices, fraud, breach of contract, alter ego claims, business torts, insurance coverage disputes, and bad faith claims on behalf of a variety of Fortune 500 companies. Now, Curtis is serving as counsel at Bartco, Zankel, Bunzel & Miller, known as Bartco, and also operates a litigation funding company that offers financing to claimants on a wide array of commercial, employment, and personal injury matters. So welcome, Curtis. And then next, Matthew. Matthew Taylor is an attorney with the Real Estate Brokers License in California. A graduate of UCLA Law School, Mr. Taylor has focused on civil litigation in California since 1995, with an emphasis on receiverships and partition cases. Matthew has acted as a receiver or a partition referee on more than 100 cases throughout California, and he handles approximately 30 partition cases per year. His notable cases included being involved with the O.J. Simpson Judgment Collection Receivership, Operation of Businesses in Receivership, and Managing Partition Sales of dozens of real estate, uh, real properties rather per year, including apartment complexes, commercial properties, single family homes, and vacant land. So those are the the formal introductions. Informally, th this this isn't just a random panel we've put together. Uh, I've and I call him Curtis because I I've known Curtis since we were undergraduates at UCLA and I was a teenager, so it was Curtis and Elizabeth back then, and uh, then we went to. Uh, 
law school at USC together. And he was actually a law school classmate of my husband's and I was there at the same time. So, so over the years, see him at reunions, bar events and whatnot. Uh, in 2019, uh, I was on the bench. I was an experienced, uh, experienced judge had, you know, 12 years of judicial experience, I think eight or nine years in civil at that point. I came to the bench with land use experience from private practice. I'd handled countless partition cases, taking them to trial, statements of decision. And Curtis, Mr. Holsworth, comes to court with the case that's actually in your materials. This uh, this golf course case of four properties on golf course. I think there are 28 ownership interests. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. Law school classmate. And oh, partition case. That'll be easy. And and I have to tell you, it, it was challenging. There were a lot of challenging issues. And every time I took the bench, I'll oh, see what's going to happen next. It was, it was very challenging. Curtis obviously did a fantastic job. Uh, 2020 happened. Courts got locked down. That was one of the cases that kind of, you know, was exploded with all the dockets. And I retired from the bench. And then time goes by. And a few months ago, I was at a bar event. I saw Curtis. I said, hey, whatever happened? You know, whatever happened in that golf course petition case? And he told me it wrapped up. And then he he told me about it. And then he told me how Matthew was involved as a petition referee and how Matthew, you know, was really a, a huge part of bringing that case to a resolution. So since it was an interesting case and one of the more complicated cases I handled, I thought, I think there's an MCLE here. So I'm thrilled to have everyone put this together. You're going to learn a lot from them. And with that, I turn it over to, to Curtis. Uh, thanks so much for your kind words, uh, Judge Pfeffer. Probably the thing that concerned me the most when I was uh, getting ready to file this case on behalf of my clients, uh, when I got the judicial assignment was whether you were going to recuse yourself from the matter. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled that you didn't. Um, and as you said, I think we got a, a fair and just result for all litigants on, on both sides of the V. Uh, in a partition, um, I think it is one of those cases where the pre- litigation or pre-filing due diligence is of utmost importance. The statute is very particular and experience and instinct on other cases um, is not at all helpful. Uh, and in fact, it's dangerous um, to assume past experience and other types of substantive matters will help you in a partition case. Um, that being said, uh, the statutes uh, that apply to partition cases are not voluminous and I don't think it takes a ton of time to immerse yourself and build some expertise uh, in this area of the law. And particularly if you're flanked at some point by a referee, um, that should give you more than enough um, background and knowledge to competently, if not expertly, carry a case um, through the trial. At the outset, what I try to figure out is what type of partition or what varietal um, is going to be pursued. There are three buckets or varietals of partition, as you can see in the slide. There is an in-kind partition, a court-ordered sale, and appraisal and buyout process. And I'll quickly touch on all three, starting with the latter. Uh, the via appraisal and buyout is a scenario where you get an objective appraisal of the property and one party agrees, one owner agrees to buy out the other party uh, at an arm's length uh, fair value of their proportionate share. Uh, this is a, uh, even though there's an applicable statute, I think this type of partition cries out as much as any for pre-litigation negotiation uh, and or mediation. Because if you end up in a buyout long into a litigation, then you've got to really stare in the mirror and ask yourselves, why didn't we mediate this and settle this and get this done before litigation? Uh, the other uh, varietals, uh, I'll touch on in kind, I'll skip to uh, the first varietal here. This is fairly rare um, compared to the other varietals insofar as uh, the court needs to be able to physically divide the property equitably. And so if you have raw land, that would be an example of the ability to do that. But if you have any structure or structures on the property, it's going to be difficult or impossible to effectuate an in-kind partition. Uh, and then finally, uh, by court-ordered sale, it's the middle varietal. Um, 
possibly the most uh, common. And that was the varietal that was litigated in the golf course case. And uh, not that it's a model of perfection by any means, but I did attach a complaint because I do find it most helpful to have an exemplar when I'm starting a, a piece of litigation, especially, especially if it's more complex. And um, it was filed um, before the recent uh, 2023 enactment of the Partition of Real Property Act. So subject to that wrinkle, um, I do think uh, you would find it a, a good starting point, particularly if you think you're going down the path of a court uh, ordered sale. Um, in terms of uh, pre-litigation uh, tactics, before we uh, quickly get to the next slide here, I do think a, a meet and confer, a serious settlement effort documented is, um, is most prudent uh, for a few reasons. One, you may be able to structure a deal uh, in by virtue of the, um, the consent of the parties. Uh, number two, you could get it into a mediation and an astute mediator who has done partitions, particularly a judicial officer who's retired, who's done them, will be able to do a mediator settlement and structure the terms properly. And you might even be able to get a lot of the terms that would be included in an inter interlocutory judgment, for example, embedded properly into a settlement agreement that'll work for all parties. And then finally, it, I think it's a good setup for downstream attorney's fees. So in my cases, I would generally send a detailed uh, letter to the opposing side explaining why partition uh, is essentially an entitlement um, with very few defenses, um, waiver typically being the, the only you know, viable defense um, that I'm aware of. And so if you send that detailed meet conferred letter explaining who your client is, what their ownership interest is, why as a matter of law they're entitled to partition the property, then I think on the back end of the case, uh, if you make a bid for attorney's fees, that's a great exhibit for uh, an attorney's fees motion. Okay, Katie, can, uh, do you have any uh, comment, uh, especially um, referee Taylor, could you make a quick uh, remark about the tenant in common wrinkle that now applies or would apply in the due diligence before filing? Sure. Um, what Curtis is referencing is the Partition of Real Property Act, which is a law that went into effect for actions filed after January 1st of this year. Um, it, it follows up on a thing called the Heirs Partition Act, which, which dealt with uh, partition actions filed after January 1st of 2022. And basically what each one of them does is it sets up a parallel channel of procedural rules for the partition cases. Um, the Heirs Property Act, which only covers things filed in 2022, deals only with inherited property. And the uh, Real Property Partition Act that went into effect this year deals anything that is held at, where the property is held as tenants in common. And if you do have such a uh, property that you're putting into partition, then you have to look at those statutes, which are new. And basically, they provide a different procedural mechanism uh, for handling these cases. And they allow um, basically at, at the very beginning a buyout option so that the remaining people who don't want the property partition can buy out the interest of the person who does at the very beginning of the case. And then after that, if they don't buy it out, then it moves through a procedure of sale, just kind of along the lines of what Curtis had described. Right. And just briefly, the, the partition statute, they're all in the Code of Civil Procedure. It starts at CCP 872.010. The new statutes that Matthew and Curtis were talking about were kind of tacked onto the end, I, I guess is kind of the way we look at it. Uh, it's at 874.311 of the CCP. So you've got your petition statutes that are very comprehensive that have been in effect for decades and decades. And at the very end, there's the new statute. And as Matthew and Curtis said, it, it's new legislation. It took effect for cases filed the beginning, or starting this year. So the, the chances, if you have a case like that, that will probably be the judge who's assigned to your matter, that, that judge's first case under the new statute too. So I appreciate that. So thank you. Uh, the next, next step, uh, the next step, I like to determine who the stakeholders are 
Um, and um, it's it's not that easy or or reliable to get documents from your client or clients. Really, the the most soundproof way to do this is to start with a title report. So. Before I file a partition, um, one of my first moves is to obtain a title report uh, and to identify all of the stakeholders because I don't always know who my clients are going to be. Uh, in the golf course case, there were upwards of six different owners, seven perhaps early on, and they weren't entirely clear about whether they wanted to advocate partition or sit passively and and simply, you know, be a defendant in a partition case, and there are now, especially with the with the new enactment, uh, is to different uh, tactical reasons for wanting to be on one side versus the other side of the V. Um, so I think it's safer instead of trying to identify exactly who your clients are to look at the title report and identi identify the entire universe of owners, because they all have to be parties to the partition litigation. That's the first step. Then the secondary step is to figure out which side of the V they're going to be on. So then you can consult with a family member or two, a, an owner or two, and see where, where the dividing point is between the folks who want to partition and the folks who don't. Then the folks who want to partition, uh, if they come to you for advice, you can do a reliable conflicts check. Um, and so far as there's two steps, basically, I feel to a conflict check. One, you run conflicts against all of the other parties opposing partition. Um, and number two, if you have more than one client, which was which was my case, uh, you include the requisite um, uh, joint waiver of conflicts uh, as between your clients, because it's possible, depending on the price point, appraisal, et cetera, there could be a split of opinion downstream during the representation or during the litigation between your own clients. So for your protection, your law firm's protection, it's critical to have that joint conflict waiver um, anticipating a worst case scenario in that regard. Well, and before we move on, it's also very important to add everybody who is a potential owner and everybody who has a potential claim, including lien holders, because one of the things that the court has authority to do is to quiet title as part of this action. And that's often very, very powerful in terms of selling it because you can clear up decades of ambiguities um, with the order, the interlocutory judgment, which determines ownership in the property. Also, it gives the court later on the authority to determine the validity and um, status of liens. So you can clear up issues having to do with liens when you're trying to sell the property and figure out who gets what money. So it's this is a really crucial step is to figure out who to add in at this point. Absolutely. And uh, as as Curtis is well aware, the CCP 872.550, you know, where partition is sought, you know, the plaintiff may join as defendants, quote, all persons unknown claiming any interest in the property among them. So again, you have that catch all there as well. Yep. Ex excellent point. Thank you. So what do you do next, Curtis? Next step, uh, what property is being uh, partitioned? So litigation guarantee is really just a fancy word for a title report. Um, so you would work with somebody like um, First American Title or FATCO. If you have a real estate practice, transactional real estate lawyers, that's extremely helpful uh, because many times they have a rapport that you're doing ongoing business with the title companies. They can pull a title report at a discount or at least pull what's called a prelim so you can get a quick and dirty, even though it's not usable in the litigation, that's a good way to get a preview of what the legal description is for the property. Um, but ultimately, you want to pull what we call lit guarantee um, to get the exact legal description. And that's essential to be attached and incorporated, incorporated by reference into the notice of pendency of action, um, aka a list pendants. And I have included a list penance, I think, in the uh, supporting materials. Once again, uh, just so you have an exemplar uh, of a list penance. And the rule of the day here, uh, this might sound really silly, but to make sure you have the correct legal description. And it sounds easy and straightforward, 
but unless you have some expertise or unless you're a real estate transactional lawyer, that's not always that clear, uh, especially if there are multiple parcels involved, uh, which was the case um, with respect to the golf course. So check it, cross check it and make sure that you get the legal description right. Um, so you don't have to go back to square one uh, later in the litigation and amend the complaint. And then you would have to refile your list pendants and it will cause you great uh, delay and really annoy a judicial officer. So one of the curves, before I move on, one of the questions that we got from the panelists had to do with whether the complaint needs to be verified or not. And that's an excellent question. I think the answer is it does not need to be verified but you might want to consider verifying it. And the reason that you might want to consider verifying it is because then you'll get a verified answer. And I have seen uh, practitioners um, move for an interlocutory judgment based on admissions in the verified answer. And that's a potential way to really short circuit a lot of litigation. Absolutely, that makes sense. Yes. And of course, when Chris referred to the legal description, so CCP 872.230, it's the the legal description, right? The meets and bounds, et cetera, and also the property address. So it has to be has uh, you know if known is is a so that's important to fully describe the property and the lease pendants procedure is also in eight seven two point two five zero of the statute. So then, what's the next step after the that, Curtis? Yes, before before we jump to the next step, um, I just want to um, comment on Matthew's point about the verify complaint. Um, it, it's a good one. And whether you verify it, the complaint or file an unverified complaint and bolster it with discovery, either way, it, you want to pin down and narrow the issues or eliminate the issues. So a simple example would be uh, you don't know necessarily if you're going to get an in-kind or a buy-sale partition right off of the bat. So my my maneuver would be to specifically allege that partition by sale is the most equitable method. And if I do that by verified complaint and they admit that line or paragraph in the complaint, then I can check that box and we're done. We don't have to litigate that particular issue. If I don't verify the complaint, I'm going to propound an RFA, and I know that I did in this case, that you know admit partition by sale is the most equitable mechanism of partition because under the law, even though in kind is not that common, it is still presumptively the preferred or most equitable method. It's rebuttable, but you can't presume that without proof or an admission from the other side. So like I said, I would always propound an RFA to nail it down or um, a verified complaint. And I'm quite certain that this was one of the um, undisputed material facts in a summary judgment motion that I prevailed upon. And I could have ended up in a trial um, if there, they had created a tribal issue of fact on which mechanism or varietal rather of partition was appropriate um, at, tr at trial. That makes sense. Okay, then finally, um, tips regarding filing the complaint. Uh, first, the filing county. Um, because a partition is a unique creature and you're not just filing documents with the court, you're also recording uh, a list pendants uh, to attach um, relative to the parcel or parcels in dispute. So you need to file your complaint in the county where the property is located. And likewise, that's the county recorder where you're going to want to record uh, your uh, list pendants. Uh, number two, the litigation guarantee. Uh, we touched upon this. Um, I attach it and incorporate it by reference uh, as part of the, um, as part of the uh, litigation process. If you miss that, I expect you would be faced with a demur or probably an order to show cause by a judge demanding that you attach it and fix um, that procedural defect. Uh, thirdly, uh, naming the owners um, so that you can get a, an interlocutory judgment in place. Not only do you need to identify all the owners, but you want to identify the nature of their ownership uh, as well as their proportionate share if the property is, is owned commonly by two or more, which is always the case for a partition. Uh, and then finally, the remedies. 
Um, I think this is important. And as a practitioner, I like to be over-inclusive because early on, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to want at the end. And I don't see any harm or prejudice in asking for the moon and the stars on the front end of a case. So even though I may not litigate um, fiercely relative to every single remedy, I'm at least going to plead it so I don't lose it, um, if that makes sense. You could get into the litigation and find out there's been an imbalance of payments on property taxes, maintenance. There's lots of things where there could be fiscal unfairness between the parties, and that's what an accounting does. It rectifies and evens out those imbalances in connection uh, with the final judgment. Likewise, attorney's fees, if you don't plead it, you may not get it. And I will say that there is not a conventional fee shifting statute under the partition law. There's a creature, it's a creature unique to partitions, um, but they are recoverable if the criteria is met. So I think it's also prudent to allege uh, attorney's fees. And then you probably wanna allege um, appointment of a referee that gives you the flexibility to pursue that and uh, by motion or by stipulation to appoint somebody um, like Matthew Taylor to be the referee. If you can uh, culminate a rapid uh, settlement or mediated resolution, then perhaps you don't have to pull that tool out of your tool chest. But again, I think it should be in the prayer of your complaint. So you have that option um, to get that referee in place uh, if and when uh, needed. Correct. And kind of to respond to the question earlier about the uh, the verified complaint. So if there's an unverified complaint for petition, the answer can't be a general denial as as a, as you see in, in a in many civil cases of you know deny everything. The the partition statute, particular 872.410 at SEC, specifically states what the answer must contain. So even an unverified complaint for petition uh, has to be met with an answer where any interest the defendant has or claims in the property, any facts tending to controvert such material allegations of the complaint as the defendant does not wish to be taken as true, and where the defendant seeks sale of the property, an allegation of the facts justifying such relief in ordinary and concise language, and likewise, the statute provides uh, the procedure for what you put in an answer if there's a lien. So, Curtis, you've I imagine you've seen that in Matthew, where there's a case where the the plaintiff in a partition case doesn't necessarily want to sale, but the defense does, correct? That does come up from time to time? Sure. It, it, it can. And that, that's an interesting point. So I'm this is my my request for some MCLA credit because I learned something new uh, when you just mentioned that particularity required in the answer. And it's very, it's fairly unconventional um, to demur to a responsive pleading. But this is an instance, as a practitioner, I would probably take a hard look at the statute um, that you just referenced. And I might come after um, the opposing side with a demur to their answer for, for a deficiency on that basis. Of course, you'll meet and confer with the uh, defendant first and see if they'll voluntarily amend, correct? Indeed. <laughs> the beloved demur to the answer. Yes. The top of every judge's most favored pleadings list, right? Yes. But, right, that, but, but since the statute says what the, the answer must contain, there that's a valid ground for it. For I a believe so. Correct. Okay. I, I'm i looking at the clock and I'm going to ask uh, Katie to turn the slide and, and hand the mic over to my, my colleagues here. Yes, I will hand it over. To Judge Pfeffer, I am actually going to pull the slides down uh, during okay, her session here and bring them Great. later. Right. So just briefly, because I know Matthew has a lot to say about referees. So, so a few things. First, what Curtis said about mediation, absolutely correct. The, the cost of litigating both sides, the referee, that comes out of the pot of if there's a sale of the property. So certainly that's an asset that would be diminishing. And, you know, sometimes people want to keep it because that's you know, the sole asset that perhaps they've inherited. So we have many garden variety cases. And again, every judge handling a civil assignment will have seen many, many partition cases. And 
I'm not speaking on behalf of all judges, but judges, especially when there's the kind of the, what we'll call the garden variety partition cases, siblings, um, you know, going after a uh, an inherited property, it's kind of seen as a probate case, right? It's it's really not about the property. It's about you know, mom and dad cared for this sibling more than the other, or burdened this sibling, or I took care of you know mom and her final illness. But now you want the equal share of the property when I was there and you weren't there. And so these things do come out in, in the court trial. And, you know, judges will have discussions with lawyers of, is there a way to settle it? And they really are family disputes. So we'd see that many times. It's one of three siblings, you know, three sisters. And, you know, one sister's on one side, one's on the other. And the third one would kind of play favorites back and forth. And that's why we had a partition trial, because at that point it was two to one on this side. And it's the court trial of, well, I paid the gardener and I paid the property tax. And 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 so kind of from a judicial perspective, that's even though it's literally a civil case, it's, it's kind of a probate thing of of those dynamics going on. So certainly early settlement, you know, early mediation, it, those discussions are very helpful to have because ultimately it comes from that pot of money. And especially when there's a referee appointed. If there is going to be a trial, see if counsel can stipulate on, you know, these are the bills, right? Instead of going through, uh, and sometimes you have to do that when there's no stipulation of going through every single bill, but but that's many of the partition cases. So early discussions uh, are certainly helpful, but that's something to keep in mind that from the judicial perspective, it's, even though it's a real property dispute, it's oftentimes kind of a sibling dispute. So there are several tools in the partition statutes. I know it's online, but it's also helpful to look in the CCP where you have, the court has the opportunity to appoint a referee and I don't wanna say outsource the fact finding, but the statute specifically references kind of outsourcing the fact finding function, recognizing the legislature that, that many of these cases are involving who paid this bill, who paid that bill. It's about reimbursement and not so much the entitlement to the partition. So the, the partition referee, and we'll get to that in Matthew's section, becomes very important. So one statute is the, the lien determination, 872.630B, is the court may appoint a referee to ascertain the facts, right? The referee is the fact finder. The referee is determining the facts. Ascertain the facts necessary for the determination required by this section of determining the liens. And then upon application of the referee of the lien holder, the court shall direct the issuance of process to compel attendance of witnesses, production of books, et cetera. And then the referee appointed under that statute prepares a written report and it will be confirmed, modified, or set aside in a new reference ordered as justice the case may require. Okay, so as a practical matter, there's a referee appointed to determine the lien issue. And assuming there's no, you know, monkey business and collusion and, you know, trickery going on, if it's you know, you've got Matthew as a professional referee, you know, disinterested, unbiased, going through the fact finding, you know, the judge will read the report, but that, you know, will, you know, very likely adopt the findings. Again, this is assuming everything's on the up and up, which, you know, it is in, in these cases with Matthew and other professional referees, but that's a very important thing. And especially now that courts are, are so overburdened. I mean, some of the some of the courts in downtown LA and, and, and the branches are 800 cases or more. The courts really don't have the time to spend, you know, a day or two adjudicating and who paid the gardener bill and here this lien holder. And it's so sending the fact finding to determine lien status and the holders and, and whatnot under CCP 872.630B is super helpful. The next statute, and again, Matthew, will talk about this at length, is the referee regarding division and sale of the property, 872.820B. Very important. So, you know, the court has the trial, right? The property is ordered sold. And guess what? You know, the sibling who didn't want the sale won't sign the listing agreement or then forced to be signed the listing agreement, won't sign the escrow instructions, won't. So a referee can cut through all that. And many times without a referee, it's, you know, the other side won't agree to this appraiser, they won't agree to this realtor, won't sign this, won't sign that. And so the referee can be very helpful in getting the sale accomplished. 
So I'll have Matthew touch on those roles of the referee. So, and from the judicial perspective, if the referee can be, it's an added cost to the parties, but it can ultimately save time because again, if you're going through the process of a partition trial, kind of definitionally, that means one of the parties doesn't want to go through with it. So the referee can be you know, very important in those situations. So Matthew, I know you have a lot to say about the references and yeah, the referee and what you put in the report. Yeah, I, I do. But let, let me first talk about going back on that mediation subject that you're talking about. Um, in many cases, because ultimately um, there's an almost absolute right to compel a, a, a partition sale. Uh, it makes sense if you're representing a party uh, or even a party opposing it to try to see if you can get a mediation sooner rather than later, because there's a limited pot of money that's generated by the sale. Um, attorney's fees for the prevailing party um, general will come out of that. Referees fees come out of that. All kinds of other fees come out of that. And it makes sense to see if you can work out with a mediator, streamlining some of the procedures, agreeing on the things you agree on, making it especially so if you can agree on things like who owns what ownership percentage, um, maybe uh, how you're going to divide the money at the end. Um, those are things that make a lot of sense, and it makes a lot of sense to do those early in the litigation as well, because it it allows you to basically streamline the rest of what's going to happen. And it, it it's really useful to go in with a professional media or someone actually knows what they're doing is handle these things, because you really have to look at them kind of backwards, which is you assume you're going to sell the property and then start off with how do you divide the money. And if you can figure out how to divide the money first, then once you sell the property, it just it just flows right into that. Um, both the I old... absolutely agree with that is it's yeah. trying to streamline the process. And again, you know, there are many cases that don't involve the sibling dynamics where there's, you know, they, they just have to have that public hashing out of all that stuff from growing up. So if there's a way to get parties to set that aside and, and again, realize this is coming out of, of the sale proceeds, it's in your interest to try to resolve it sooner rather than later. That's very, right. very important. Yeah. And, and both the, I'll call them the legacy statutes and the new partition of real property act. Both of those statutes very explicitly allow the parties to pick procedures that are different than the statutory procedures and require the judge to accept those if they're agreed by all the owners of the property. So that's a thing to consider. I mean, I have a case right now that I was appointed on where they wanted to do kind of a hybrid between a partition by appraisal and a partition by sale. And they agreed to a procedure where they were going through basically a partition by appraisal process, but if the if the person doesn't want to buy it through the appraised price, then it immediately drops into a partition by sale without a delay and without any other cost. So those are the kind of things that if you do want to mediate the case or if you do want to at least talk about resolution of those things, they'll make it faster. Absolutely. Um, but but let, me, let me talk to you about a referee because we've talked a lot about a referee and what the role referee plays. This the partition referee is a unique thing in California statutes. Um, it's different from many other related things like a receiver or a discovery referee. And it's different because what it does is it gives the uh, the appointed referee both some sort of quasi judicial authority in terms of um, making taking testimony, uh, making recommendations to the court, but also gives the the uh, the referee um, the authority to go ahead and actually manage the sale. And so that's really usually the most important reason to have a referee is because if you don't have a referee in your case, it's very hard to process a sale through if one of the parties, one of the owners is either being simply just uh, truculent and not signing anything, not agreeing to anything, even ordered by the court, or in a default type situation. You'd be surprised at how often these cases go by default. Um, that was one of the uh, questions that came up in the Q&A that's, that's coming through on our scrolling, is whether you can proceed by default. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, going back to what Curtis said about structuring your complaint, you should absolutely structure the complaint with the, uh, the assumption that you might get it by default. Because a lot of the people just stick their head in the sand and not respond. And you want to make sure that your complaint is structured so that you can get to what you want by default. Um, but in, going back to the, why you'd have a referee. So the main purpose of a referee in managing the sale, big picture, is that the referee is in charge of basically taking the sale from beginning all the way through the end. So the court order appointing the referee will normally give the referee the job to hire a real estate agent, set the listing price negotiate the sale terms, negotiate contracts, go under escrow. And all these things are done by the referee with the authority in the court order. And you do not need the signatures or agreement or approval of any of the parties. And it's really the only way that you can push a sale through if it's been ordered by the court. Right. Um, and that is super important. Again, because I again, there are many cases where it, the property is not, 
you know, relatively, you know, in LA real estate, not super valuable. The parties are fairly tied on money and they opt to go without the referee. And again, it, it could end up costing more money because then it's coming to court. Again, the person, the other side won't sign the listing agreement, won't sign this, won't sign that. The sale's done. They won't sign the final. So although the referee, you know, there, there's a cost to that in savings of, of time in consummating the sale and also coming to court, there could be huge savings with the referee. Right. And, and we have up there on the screen, the CCP 873.010. That's the basic statute that gives the judge the authority to appoint a referee in the first place. Um, the question is, who's going to be the referee? The statute doesn't really talk about who's the referee. There's no specific criteria or requirements for being a referee, but there are things that would exclude you from it. And that's CCP 873.050. And, and it, it excludes by statute anybody who's involved in the case as a party or anybody related to the judge or anybody related to the clerk or the deputy clerks of the court. Um, other than that, pretty much anybody can be a referee. Normally, the way that a referee is suggested or selected is that a party will nominate the referee, will submit to the court a name and a, and a CV, and the judge will then decide whether that person is appropriate for the case. Um, the We've referenced a couple of times a thing called interlocutory judgment. So in, a tr in the traditional partition cases, it, it follows a very unique procedure and where there's basically a two-step litigation. A litigation step number one is the judge determines who the ownership interest in the property is, whether there's a right to partition it and how the partition should happen and appoints a referee. That's in a thing called an interlocutory judgment. And the interlocutory judgment is basically giving the referee the marching orders in terms of what to do. Um, and then once you get the interlocutory judgment, then the referee is given the job of going out and um, hiring any professionals that are necessary, hiring real estate agents, hiring appraisers, hiring engineers, surveyors, anything that's necessary to put in the market, handling all of the marketing and sales efforts and, and getting it under contract. Once it goes under contract, then the referee is required to go back to court. And that would be the next slide. Um, and you're required to go back to court and under CCP 873.710 and some statutes starting there, the, re the referee cannot close escrow on a sale without going back to court and getting the court to confirm the sale. So the re referee has to give to the judge information about the sale. And then there's a there's a motion and a hearing procedure. And the judge then has the authority to accept or reject the sale. Uh, if it is rejected, then the referee basically has to start over. By the way, that's very rare to have it rejected. Um, if it is approved, then then the uh, the referee goes forward and consummates the sale. Um, the referee is the person who signs the grant deeds. The referee is the person who receives the money from escrow. The referee basically handles all of the all of the document related things. And the reason why that's important is because if you don't have a referee appointed to do it, any single owner of even one percent could hold up the sale by just simply saying, "I'm not signing." You know, right. I'm not going to sign something. Right. And quick question, uh, Matthew, with respect to partition of property. So CCP, the, the very first statute, section 872.010, property subject to partition is real and personal property. So most cases, it would be in my court, would be real property. Of course, you can have a partition of personal property. I presume the personal property would have to be worth enough to make it worth litigating over. Mm -hmm. a boat or a mobile home, et cetera. So just quickly, have you, have you, do you much, do you do much differently if it's a partition of a of personal property? So the procedure is basically the same, although I'll tell you this, I've never seen anybody partition a piece of property other than real property because it's just simply usually not valuable enough. I mean, I could imagine you could have some artwork or something like that that might have some value. Um, I've just never seen one. Right. That, that would be my thought too. The yacht, right? Yep, yep. The private plane, right? Yep. And then, and of course, again, uh, there was a question as to the petition. Th this applies, th this is not division of marital property at all. That's CCP 872.210 subsection B, that division of marital property, you know, the, the family home, the, all that, whether something separate community property, th that's all handled in the family court. So none of this is marital property. So yeah, correct. Anything that's marital property is not handled in the in in the uh, in in the partition action. The most common things I see is what Judge Pfeffer talked about, which is basically people have jointly inherited property, and that represents about fifty percent of what I see. The other thing that I see that's fairly common fact pattern is you have people in a romantic relationship, but they didn't get married, and now they've broken up and they can't go to family court because they never got married. 
uh, but they've bought property together. Sometimes they've you know been together for decades, and the civil court is left to kind of pick up the pieces and figure out how to divide it. And so if they've jointly purchased real property like a family house, then it gets divided under the civil partition statutes. Correct. So uh, let's move on to the next statute or the next slide. Um, the next issue is what happens once the sale happens. So the sale's been completed. By statute, the sales proceeds go to the referee, and the referee holds them until further order of the court. Um, CCP 873.750 um, tells that the um, tells the referee to hold that. Um, one of the most important things is down on your right hand corner of the uh, of the slide, CCP 873.850. If you don't know any of the other statutes in this in this uh, presentation, you should remember that one and look at it because it's very short, but it is the statute that gives the court the continuing jurisdiction to divide the proceeds after the sales happened. So I mentioned earlier that these, these follow basically a, a two-step process. Step one is the court determines whether there's a right to partition and then has it partitioned. And step two is then you have to deal with who gets the money and how do you get the money? And it's not as simple as just simply dividing on the ownership interest because it the by statute, um, the parties, anybody who paid an unequal portion of almost anything during the joint ownership is entitled to get reimbursed for that. So if you paid more mortgage payments, um, you know, more property taxes, you paid to have the air conditioner repaired or the roof repaired or whatever, or maybe it was operated as a rental property and somebody collected the rents and didn't share them, all those things get divided. Um, by the court under CCP 873.850. Um, this, by the way, is another one of those inflection points where it's really useful potentially to go to mediation. If you haven't done it in the first step at the very beginning, once there is a sale and there's a fixed pot of money to be fought over, that is a great time to go to mediation because if you don't go to mediation, um, then you're back in the court system waiting your turn in the court system to have it resolved. And there's there's a couple ways you could do it through a referee, but at the end result or the end at the end of everything, it's going to have to have some judge rule on it somewhere. And and we all know how backlog the courts are these days, especially because of COVID. I've seen a lot of times where people will go to mediation and they'll come out of the mediation. They've worked out how to divide the money. And then it's just a matter of, of getting a stipulated order and the referee pays everybody and everybody walks all, you know, moves away with their money in a week or two. So. Right. And again, from the from the court's perspective, again, this all makes sense is there's there's a right to partition and it's it's going to be paid from from the proceeds or if there's a buyout, you know, it, it, they're going to be paid. So it makes sense to do that sooner than rather than later. Quick question for Curtis. There, there's an issue about the interlocutory judgment. I know we kind of briefly went over it. Uh, CCP 872.610 at SEC talks about the status of the title that the court determines the status of the title, basically a quiet title, 872.620, the court shall ascertain the state of the title, 872.630, determine status of liens. We have the interlocutory judgment at CCP 872.720, as far as getting an interlocutory judgment. So from the judicial perspective, you get a judgment by, by default, by trial, or by summary judgment. So Briefly, Curtis, if you can weigh in, and then Matthew, typically, how do you see just a rough breakdown of the cases you've seen of where the interlocutory judgment is obtained through default, through summary judgment, or through you know judgment by a court trial? Uh, thanks. Um, certainly, uh, as in any case, if, if there's a default, you can obtain a judgment. That's you know a, bla a black and white issue. Likewise, summary judgment. Uh, in, in this case, I ended up getting egg on my face because I filed a regular lawn motion in front of the uh, Honorable Judge Pfeffer. Oh. <laughs> and I had my motion denied uh, for failing to file a summary judgment. Now, in fairness, it was during COVID and the timelines for motions, as you may recall, especially to tee up a summary judgment was extremely lengthy. So while we had time statutorily to file a summary judgment, we just thought that the upside of getting an adjudication sooner was just so overwhelmingly great. Even though we do procedurally, the motion, you know, could very well be denied. So it was without prejudice. And then we simply spooled up and we filed a dispositive motion. Um, the only other comment, and then I'll uh, let um, Matthew jump in here, is as to the interlocutory judgment and uh, getting a mediator involved, the only reason I couldn't mediate this case uh, was because I had 
an unreasonable opposing counsel in the litigation, in my opinion, because I proposed mediation with an attached or a preview of a proposed uh, interlocutory judgment. Because I felt to give a mediator some guidance, let's figure out where the battle lines really are here. Because if you're entitled to partition as a matter of law, what are we really fighting over? So right. I framed up a complete you know, or proposed interlocutory judgment, and I floated that to the other side. I said, mark it up, make it bloody, whatever you want to do, but let's at least frame up where the battle lines are. Then we can submit this to a mediator to try to nail down the, a couple of the two or three things that are disputed about you know, what is inevitable in terms of in, interlocutory judgments inevitable for the most part. It's just a question of what's going to be in it. And unfortunately, I couldn't get them to offer any comment on the interlocutory judgment and, and eventually had to do it the hard way by, by virtue of summary judgment. Right. So certainly the parties can stipulate to an interlocutory judgment. Um, absolutely. In right. fact, technically what occurred is we got a tentative ruling and a final ruling on the summary judgment that we filed. And before the judge uh, that um, succeeded you, Dropped, dropped his gavel, the other side kind of scurried to our side and said, let's negotiate. And so at that point, we had all the leverage and we got the interlocutory judgment done. All right. Thank you. And then Matthew, because I bring, because I, I know, sir, a few questions on the chat about that. So of the cases you've gotten uh, as, as a referee of the, from the interlocutory judgment stage, how much would you say were from default judgment versus stipulated judgment versus summary judgment or trial? Uh, I would say the ones that I see, probably at least a third of them are default judgments. Okay. Um, and and ma mainly that's because it would be very difficult to process a sale against a defaulting defendant who's just right. not there and ignoring you. So probably I see a larger percentage than what's what's out there in the system as a whole. Um, occasionally the things go all the way through to trial, not very often. Um, the other procedural mechanism you might want to look at is like a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Um, because if you have verified pleadings or if the answer admits the things that are necessary to enter interlocutory judgment, uh, I've seen people do that. I've, I've seen people honestly just file a motion that's titled something like motion for interlocutory judgment or motion to appoint referee or something like that. I know that Curtis is saying Judge Pfeffer denied it on that it should have been a summary judgment. Some judges will allow it. The, the, the statutes are ambiguous in this. Um, and if I were a practitioner, I'd probably... Uh, I'd probably uh, try it because it can short circuit a lot of things and get to where you're going to get to inevitably anyways. Right. If there's no, so, if there's no dispute about ownership. All right. And now we're kind of getting the way to civil procedure, yeah. but since it, the interlocutory judgment, it, that's not appealable because it's not final, but someone could seek writ relief, I imagine. I, I believe it may actually be one of the things that's appealable. I've seen Absolutely. people appeal those. Yeah. I think there's a statutory ground for appealing that because I've seen that. Okay. No. Oh. But it's, it's, it's not a final judgment because it keeps open the issue of how to divide the money. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. And so the, and you had the next issue then? Next yeah. Case. I mean, and I'll, I'll touch on this really quickly because we've got a lot of questions that are worth mentioning this, but the right. quick answer is how's the referee paid? The referee is paid from the sales proceeds. So if you're nominating a referee, uh, the referee doesn't work for you. You don't have to come up with money to pay the referee. There's no retainer or anything like that. The, the referee is appointed by the court, works for the court, and is paid from the sales proceeds at the end of the sale. So that's just a quick way to short circuit that entire slide. Correct. Right. Can the referee be appointed at the CMC early on in the case, the first appearance before the court? I've never seen that. Okay. But I imagine if the party, I mean, that's something the party should meet and confer on. Yeah. I mean, if they, I, I, I at any point in time, if the people stipulated to it, they might. Um, but I, I can't, I, I've never seen a judge appoint a referee just as a, you know, you're at a status conference. He says, well, I'm going to appoint the referee to sell the property. Right. Okay. All right. So we got a ton of questions. Uh, should we take some questions? Sure. I mean, oh, just briefly on your report. Yeah. Um, have you had, I you know there, there's a procedure for objection to a referee report. Have you seen yes. many challenges to your reports? Yes. Uh, okay. the, the losing side always challenges them. No, actually, I, that's, that's, I, I'm being facetious. Probably half the time the losing side challenges it. About half the time the referee's report um, is what clears the way for the people to say, okay, let's just agree to that. 
Um, and so that's that's something that's useful. But yeah, people challenge them sometimes. Um, the they, the statutes allow the judge to basically reject, accept, or you know, or or or, or modify what the referee says. And I agree with Judge Pfeffer that in general, most of the judges don't want to get down in the weeds of like going through six years of property tax bills and stuff. So they'll usually probably Barter accept it. Or... Yeah. Yeah. We did the we paid the trash bill for six months? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do it. But if there's a way to streamline that process. Uh, quick question. So we briefly touched on the different stages where a referee can be appointed. One is the ascertainment of liens under CCP 872. 0.630B. So before the interlocutory judgment of what the status of the liens is kind of the court, you know, sending the fact finding function to the referee. Have you seen that often, Matthew? Um, no, no, that would be fairly rare. Okay. Uh, so what's more, there are a lot of liens on a property and that may make the trial and the interlocutory judgment lengthy. That might be something to consider. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it occasionally. I've been involved with dealing with liens, but it's not usually at the very beginning. It's usually closer towards the end because oftentimes people don't focus on what the liens are until they know what, what the money is and how to divide it up. Right. And I know we had a number of questions about the, the new statutes or the new section of the statute, which you mentioned briefly. It starts at 874.311. So it's at the end of the partition statute. It pertains to certain properties held as tenants, right? Tenant in common is not property held in joint tenancy, correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, the new statutes apply only to things that are tenancy in common, not joint tenancy. Right. So again, there's there's a, you know, there can be a whole lecture just on the new statutes, but it's important just to know they're there. But also as importantly is that as many partition cases as your judge may have had before you bring a case under the new statute, just keep in mind that maybe the judge's first time applying that statute in court. So the way you've done it the last 50 times or 100 times might not necessarily apply. I think, like you said, there are alternate procedures. I think there's procedures for, you know, the, the realtors and the appraisers. And there's, it's not necessarily as a right. So just be aware of it. But again, be aware that maybe the judge's first time too. Judges don't want to get this stuff wrong. So, you know, walk it through and you know, and, and make sure that the uh, statute's quoted and, and discussed with the court. I know, Matthew, if you or Curtis, anything you wanted to discuss as far as the new statute? So no Curtis, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, I, I'd say the thing with the new statute, it's not that long. Read it. It's super detailed. And keep in mind, one of the um, CCP 874.313, I think, is one of the most important parts of it. It's the statute that says that the new one supplements the existing statutes. So it doesn't completely throw them out and replaces it. It 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 overrides anything that's contrary to it, but anything that's not contrary to it from the old statutes and the old case law, they still exist. And so you basically got these sort of two procedures that you're going to have to, if you're the, the practitioner, you're going to have to figure out, does it apply under the new one? If not, then fall back on the old one where it would, where it would cover it. Absolutely. I'm I'm quiet because I'm I'm trying to type and respond to as many questions as I can. Um, right. to the participants, because there are a lot, lot, there are a lot of great questions. Uh, right, a lot of great questions. That could be partition one hundred two. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I I'm, see I'm, you saw me pop I on. I do want to mention. I'm, I'm super I'm sorry impressed to interrupt. With these I do want to mention that we're at the one o'clock um, stop moment. Um, to hop off, um, you will receive your full MCLE credit, and that is okay. I hope that our speakers are, will stick around and answer just a few more of these questions because there are so many great, great ones. Yes. Um, but when you do leave the program, you'll be directed to a brief survey. We would appreciate if you take a few minutes to fill that out. We do read all the answers. Um, in fact, today's program is brought to you as a result of a prior survey where we had a request for some partition action information um, that Judge Pfeffer saw. Um, so speakers, if you don't mind sticking around a few minutes, I'm sure we would all very much appreciate it. <laughs> I think, it, yes, we have a lot of great questions. Um, mm -hmm. and again, a lot of these, uh, again, we have the sample orders in the material. There's a sample interlocutory judgment. Uh, what I would suggest on any petition case, again, the law is there. It's, it's pretty clear. I mean, it walks you right through what's needed. So just make sure you kind of like follow the statute to the T, because that's what the judge is going to be doing. It's just going to go to the statute, you know, open the book or pull, probably pull it up online. I'm probably one of the last few people to open the book. 
but just follow it and see that all the elements are there. And many questions are, well, what is sufficient, et cetera? You know, just as in any other civil case, it, you know, we have the burden of proof and you put in the evidence. But um, I think, Curtis, what you've underscored is with the litigation guarantee and the title reports, it's important to get all the interested parties there and you can have to catch all anyone claiming an interest, correct? Any Anything else you do, Curtis, to ensure that you have all the parties that you need to have in court with you? Yeah, it, the root of it is with the litigation guarantee or getting a full title report as opposed to a prelim. Correct. Right. When I was in private practice, I got some litigation guarantees. So I think many title companies, I'm not sure all of them, but I know you mentioned First American Title. I think that's why I used in the 90s for litigation guarantees. But so ask a title report company if they will do also a litigation guarantee that names all the interests. And again, if, if the amount of liens warrants it, that may be something for a referee to handle as well. But the, the issue of interest and liens, it's all determined before or at the time of the interlocutory judgment. But Judge Furfer, we've got over a hundred questions. We obviously can't answer. We obviously can't answer yeah, all I of know. them. Do you want to do you want to scroll through and maybe see if there's a I've couple been that, scrolling that, through. That, that are that are kind of common and I've and... been. <laughs> Well, I mean, here's, I'm, typing, here's... I'm typing frantically here. Um, could you, in in sixty seconds or less, um, Matthew, explain whether you could evict somebody and have the unique power to do that at the conclusion? Because we did have a good question about that, and I think I may have had to do a yes. UD after a quiet title action as the only mechanism. But could you jump in and maybe circumvent that or have the unique? Sure. Well, let's, let's yeah, let's... A, a holdover tenant or occupant. yeah. Let, right. Let's talk about. There's two issues. The question is whether the the tenant or the person in in the property is is a, a tenant or an owner, and so you got two different issues. Uh, if you're if you're a co-owner who's a party to the partition action, um, the the court, I believe, as part of the partition action, has the authority to order you to leave the property. Um, there's not a specific statute that says that, but there's a statute that basically says that the court has the authority in the partition cases to do to enter any other orders necessary to enforce its orders. And uh, I think every judge I've ever approached on this subject takes the position that if you can order the property sold, then you can certainly order the people to cooperate with you or leave the property so it can be sold. Yeah, Yet, completely different issue, though, on um, third party tenants, people who might have a lease or something like that. There's nothing that I'm aware of in the partition statutes that allows the court to basically um, evict an otherwise lawful tenant. And so if you have a tenant in there and if they're not if you don't otherwise have a way to evict them by terminating their tenancy, then you'll have to sell the property subject to their tenancy. So uh, on the other hand, if you do have the grounds for eviction, um, one of which generally is that you're taking the property off the real off the market if, if they don't have a, an existing valid lease, um, that could be a ground for eviction and, and, and ground for a UD, separate UD action. Correct. And Matthew, the referee has the power to to hire certain I mean, you can hire uh, an appraiser, you can hire a realtor. How does the referee, there's a question, how does the referee come up with the sales price? Answer is? Sure. Uh, well, a couple of different ways. Uh, usually for the sales price, I get a uh, what's called a broker's price opinion, which is the real estate agents give me a listing of what they think the property is worth in a comparative market evaluation. Um, I'll forward to the parties, the owners, and get their comments on it. Um, if if we need to, we can get a formal appraisal, although I usually don't recommend going to the trouble of getting appraisal just to set the price because the reality is that the market will set the price. And as long as you get it within the ballpark, uh, then that's probably close enough. Correct. Okay. And underscore the report of the referee, again, it, it's certainly helpful to the court. Again, if everything is in the up and up, it looks reasonable, you know, likely the court you know, will adopt it. But again, by no means is the court rubber stamping it as specifically in the statute. CCP 873.290, the confirmation, modification, or setting aside the report. I mean, the court can just reject the whole thing mm -hmm. and start from scratch. Yeah. Um, but but so there's there's a procedure for that of, you know, you're on the other side of, you know, you're the side, you represent the side in the petition that didn't want the petition, doesn't want this referee, you know, your guy doesn't want to sign anything. But so there's always a chance to object and the court may just reject the referee's report altogether. So it's not as... It's not as if, oh, no, the court appointed the referee. All hope is lost. You know, there's obviously due process built into the statute. 
Right. And and keep in mind helpful. that 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 the referee is not the judge in the case. The judge right. in the case is always the person who's in charge of everything. The the, the referee has certain delegate authority from the judge. Right. Um, but but if you're not happy with what the referee is doing, the parties can go back to court at any time and say, Judge, I, I don't I disagree with what the referee is doing. He shouldn't he shouldn't set the price at this level, he shouldn't accept this offer, things like that. I mean, there are various there are specific statutes that allow parties to contest things, like there's a statute that allows people to object to a proposed sale the referee makes. Um, right. But but even without that, there's a specific statute that allows anybody to file a thing called a motion for instructions. And a motion instructions is the statutory procedural mechanism by which anybody can get in front of the judge and say, judge, I want you to instruct the referee to do something different than what the referee is doing. Uh, by the way, the referee can also file a motion for instructions. And, and if I'm the referee and I come to a, a fork in the road and it looks like it's not addressed by my existing orders, I will often go back to court and ask the judge what to do. Right. I know it's a little bit of a divergence, but there have been a number of questions about the family law issue. I gave the statute, but uh, in, in the family law court, it, you know, you could have a marital property, you know, family home, that there's a percentage ownership interest by somebody else, uh, you know, in law or whatnot. So, you know, the family law courts have the ability to bring in joinders. Uh, so there, there's no partition of marital estate. And again, I sat in family law for a number of years before civil. There are many, many cases where, you know, someone else who's entitled to the family home is brought in and is is a party in that limited purpose in the family law proceeding. So this is you know, not marital estate. So again, as to whether this applies to this situation or that, look in you know the family code, the civil code, but the marital property that's all it's all in the family law court. Yeah. Okay. Another excellent question I've seen pop up a couple times about uh, whether lien holders need to, need to be named, such as a mortgage holder or a bank. And maybe Matthew, you could tackle this. What I vaguely recall when I did a quiet title action, I believe I had to name uh, a bank lien holder as a nominal defendant, and they just sort of stayed by the side, by the wayside. But in a partition, I don't recall naming all lien holders. They were identified in the list pendants and handled and taken care of in conclusion with the sale. But I don't remember them being named as parties. So can you speak to that issue for a couple of these folks? Yeah, I, I, I would say this. I've seen differences in how people handle this in practice, but I believe that the statute would require the naming of all defendants. There is a statute that defines who's supposed to be a defendant in a partition action, and it says anybody who has an interest in, in the property. I think a lien holder's interest is enough of an interest that you can certainly justify adding in them as a defendant. And it, I think it, as from a practical point of view, it makes a lot of sense because if the court has the authority to determine the validity of these liens and the priority of the liens, they ought to be they ought to be parties, number one, so they can contest it. And number two, I think when you're dealing with orders that the court makes, um, whether they're going to be ultimately honored by the title insurance companies depends on whether the people who um, whose interests are affected had the right to participate in the litigation. So from my point of view as a as a referee, um, I would much prefer to see every single person who has a potential interest listed on there and as a party. So they're all at the table and everything gets resolved with everybody at the table. Thank you. That's certainly the prudent practice. Yeah. Question about jury versus court trial. The statute refers repeatedly to the court, right? The court shall ascertain the status of title 872.620. You know, the court shall order the property divided 872.810. Have you ever seen a jury proceeding in any of these, Curtis or Matthew? I have not. I have not either. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the statute refers to the court and even, you know, the fact finding function of the court. So, yeah. And, and, and I see there's a couple of questions about uh, interlocutory judgments and samples. If you look under the um, the handouts, the handout materials that yes. came along with your registration, there are two interlocutory judgments there. Um, Curtis uh, gave you a sample from the, uh, the golf course land case that he at referenced at the very beginning. I gave you also a sample that is uh, not relating to any particular case. It's just a it's just an example, exemplar kind of one. Um, that's a thing that I developed during the month or so off I had in March of 2020 when I couldn't go to work and I got bored. And so what I did was I sat down and I took all the uh, judgments I could find and put them into a sample that I could hand out to people. So if anybody wants that in electronic format, I'm happy to hand it out to you. Um, and you'll see that it has provisions dealing with all sorts of the things we've talked about here. Um, so keep that in mind. I think it's I think it's useful. We've we've had um, virtually every judge we've ever presented to has accepted it in in that format or in a modified format. Right. And again, what both of you said is you'll put together the interlocutory judgment that your client would like early on in the case and present it to the other side. And say, look, this is what we're asking for. 
Can you agree or not? Or you know, see what the areas of difference are. Maybe there are 15 items of dispute or 15 items in general in the case, and there's a dispute on one of them or 14 of them. But it's it's helpful to know up front, and that's a good start to try to negotiate. Because again, it's, it all comes from the same pot of money. So the more you litigate, the less you get from the sale of the property. So those yeah. are all excellent. Examples. Before we get any further, I would like to um, uh, jump in here. We're about 10 minutes uh, over time. I want to be cognizant of everybody's afternoon and lunch hour. Um, I will make a note of the, the questions that we didn't get to um, for our speakers. Um, but I want to thank each of the three of you very, very much. Um, and, you know, we could listen to you talk all afternoon. Some great conversation here. Maybe we need a 102, just like you said, exactly. Judge Pepper. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of great questions. So I think in response to one of the questions, I said, feel free offline. Um, Absolutely. I'm more than happy to the extent I can by email to, you know, answer, you know, any question if you can just repropound it by email. And I, I am sure my colleagues would be happy to do the same. So so by all means, I apologize for not getting to everything. But but uh, you racked up just a, a, a great a great many questions. I see 99 pending, and I've been typing yeah. the last 10 <laughs> minutes, answering as many as I can. So right, and I see that. Interest. And we've captured the questions too, so we'll try to answer the best we can offline. And 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 feel free, anybody who wants to ask follow up questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is in our presentation materials, and I'm happy to talk to people. I, obviously, I can't talk about case specific things for cases I'm a referee in, but I'm happy to talk about general questions. Absolutely. Well, again, it was a pleasure. So who would have known? You're right. This is my court, and now you can't get rid of me. She's retired. No, she's back. She's back. We spend lunch together <laughs> talking partition, but it's it's been fantastic. Because again, you know, these don't come up that often, and um, it's I, I learned a lot. So I appreciate you spending the time. Yeah. Well, well thank you. For and the other thanks panelists. so much, Judge Pepper. Thanks. Uh, thank Matt, you all three. And and Katie, uh, terrific. Really appreciate it. Thank you. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.